We are so honored to have my congressman, he's probably, uh, many of you in this room, he's probably your congressman also, Congressman Jeff Duncan. He is a South Carolina native and a graduate of Clemson University. He is president and CEO of a family-owned real estate marketing firm that specializes in real estate auctions, or he was president. Um, Congressman Jeff Duncan served in the South Carolina House of Representatives from 2002 to 2010, at which time he was elected at the, to the United States House of Representatives representing U.S. District 3. Jeff is married and to his wife, Melody, for over 25 years, and they have three children together. And if any of you have been following what Jeff Duncan has been doing, uh, you know he is a, a true champion for the citizen and for liberty. Uh, he's been pushing back on uh, the Gitmo detainee issue. He's been raising awareness about the refugee issue and uh, many others. Congressman Duncan, welcome, and thank you so much for coming to Clemson. Thank you, Diane. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. <clears throat> I'll stand behind the podium some, but I'll probably get out and walk around. And uh, thanks for having me. It's a great opportunity to talk about national security, talk about the threats that we face. I'd like to approach it really from a, a position that you probably don't hear very much uh, about. I chair the Western Hemisphere Subcommittee on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. I've been involved on that committee, uh, I think, since I've been in Congress, but it's an area that's very interesting and has been very interesting to me. And I'd like to just uh, talk about the national security in this hemisphere because you're not getting that on the nightly news. Um, for too long, our nation has been focused on the Middle East. We've been focused, uh, we were attacked. It's absolutely correct to focus on where the terrorist threats have come from. But this is a more complex world now and terrorist threats are really coming from all over. Uh, the, the national security aspects are complex, they're interconnected, um, all the countries are interconnected, and um, the security environment is definitely interconnected. So I'd like to focus on, um, starting off, we have what's called the Southern Command. And that is a military uh, command post uh, based out of Florida that's focused on this hemisphere and working with our partner nations in this hemisphere. Um, I got to know General Kelly, a Marine general, four star, that was uh, head of Southern Command up until um, I think November or December. And he really was focused on something that I'd focused on since I'd been in Congress and that was the Iranian threat in the Western Hemisphere, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a little while, and that's really what brought General Kelly and I uh, to, to talk a good bit uh, about the uh, Western Hemisphere. They've got a new um, commander at the Southern Command, but they talk a lot about, in their posture statement, transnational criminal organizations. Now, these are groups of maybe the cartel, drug smugglers that are not only smuggling cocaine and marijuana from the Western Hemisphere, from South America, Latin America, uh, over to Africa and transit up through the Middle East to get to Europe, there's a heck of a lot of that going on. But we also see the transnational uh, criminal organizations wanting to bring drugs, people, weapons, you name it, into America, into this country. And that's where we need to have our antenna up. Because these transnational criminal organizations could be or possibly are and are working with terrorist organizations. If you think about the southwest border, there's evidence of numerous narco tunnels that have been uh, dug underneath the southwest border that resemble very much the tunnels that have been dug up under the Gaza area into Israel by Hamas. Very similar to what we see in Lebanon with Hezbollah. So we believe that at some point in time there's been some collusion between uh, the narco-terrorist or the narco-criminal uh, uh, organizations and the, uh, and the terrorist organizations. Um, we talk a lot about and when you're talking with Southcom, uh, special interest aliens. These are people that uh, are trying to get into this country. And we all have heard about the Syrians. And I'm going to go into that a little bit more in detail uh, in just a moment. But so I focused on the Western Hemisphere for so long. So, Jeff, why focus on the Western Hemisphere when we see foreign fighters coming into Europe? We see mass migration of military-aged men going into Europe. Uh, why are you so focused on the South? 
Well, because of the things I've learned. First off, Iran has opened 80 cultural centers in Latin America. Now think about this. There's not a whole lot of religious or economic ties between Persia, the Iranians, and Latin America. They're basically Christian or Catholic uh, version of Christian Christianity. Uh, we share a same heritage with the folks in Latin America. In fact, the same people that discovered the New World uh, that became the United States of America also discovered Latin America. Names like Magellan and Cortez were all explorers exploring not only the United States, but they're also exploring uh, the whole of Latin America in this hemisphere. And so when I started learning about the Iranian involvement in the Western Hemisphere, my antennas perked up. And then I started learning about an area in South America known as the Tri-Border Region. The Tri-Border Region, if you can think about South America and the Southern Cone, if you can think about an area between Argentina, Paraguay, and Brazil, right up in the top part of Argentina, it's where all three borders meet. It's a very, very tight geographic area known as the Tri-Border region, region, or you may have heard it called the Triple Frontier. But in that area, starting in the 1960s and really ramping up in the 1980s after the war in Lebanon, we saw a lot of Lebanese uh, head to that part of South America. What the original tie was, I don't know. But a lot of Lebanese started settling in that area of Brazil and, uh, and Paraguay. And once you have the Lebanese there, you start seeing Hezbollah influence. Hezbollah is a Lebanese um, Islamic Jihad organization. Uh, mainly focused on going after Israel and eliminating the Israeli state, uh, but also involved in terrorism in general. Hezbollah is, a, is supported and backed by Iran. So as a sidebar, just think about the Iranian nuclear deal that we just had that John Kerry uh, stands out and, and holds up as, as his legacy. The Iran deal with the United States and P5 plus one countries set the Iranian, the nuclear part aside for a minute Iran has access to $150 billion, $150 billion. The largest state sponsor of terrorism now has access to $150 billion with which they can do anything. They can help inject some cash into their economy to help their people, and they may do some of that. That's what John Kerry thinks they're going to do with all the money. I think they're going to use it to financially support Hezbollah and Hamas and other terrorist organizations around the globe, because Iran is the largest state sponsor of terrorism, bar none. And they haven't said that they're going to back off of that. In fact, they said we're going to continue to support our friends Hezbollah and Hamas. And so they've got $150 billion. I think you can buy a lot of financial support for terrorism um, with $150 billion. That's weapons and that's other things. And so uh, with Iran having that much access to that much money and understanding that they've got uh, financial ties to Hezbollah, and Hezbollah is very active in the tri-border region I just mentioned, then reason leads me to believe that Iran's going to be involved in that tri-border region as well. So what makes me come to that conclusion? Well, that tri-border region, Hezbollah, has been very, very active in the past. In 1992 and 1994, there were two bombings in Buenos Aires, Argentina, one of which uh, targeted the Israeli embassy, the other which targeted a place called the Argentine Mutual Israeli Association, or AMIA. The AMIA bombing uh, killed 85 people, wounded another 100 or so, the largest loss of life from an act of terror in the Western Hemisphere prior to 9-11. Think about that. The largest loss of life from an act of terror, it was a car bombing on the AMIA facility in Buenos Aires, Argentina, it was the largest loss of life prior to 9-11 happened there. And it was because of activity from Hezbollah, the case hadn't been solved yet, but Hezbollah from the tri-border region was believed to be involved. And we believe Iran was backing Hezbollah. There was a guy named Alberto Nisman, who was an Argentine prosecutor who was investigating this. He was investigating not only the AMIA bombings of 1994, he was also investigating the prior presidency who just got uh, defeated in November, a lady named Christina Kirchner and her family and their ties to uh, that, covering up that bombing, their ties to Iran um, and Hugo Chavez, to the point where Someone was caught with $800,000 in a suitcase coming through, um, uh, through Venezuela with that money headed to Christina Kirchner to help fund her presidential campaign. That money was believed to be Iranian money coming through Hugo Chavez to Argentina. 
So all of a sudden, Christina Kirchner said, well, we don't think Iran had anything to do with that bombing in 1994. In fact, we're going to put off uh, Alberto Nisman, the prosecutor. We're going to poo-poo his report. Well, last January, he was uh, ready to present that report to the Argentine Congress, and he was murdered in his apartment on Sunday morning with a bullet behind his ear. Now, her presidency originally rolled out that it was suicide. Well, how many people have you ever heard that shoot themselves behind the ear? No, that was an assassination. He was assassinated before he went to Argentine Congress to reveal the connections between Christina Kirchner, Hugo Chavez, Iran, and the poo-pooing of the whole AMIA bombing. So I'm, I'm telling all you, you all that to really lay groundwork to show that there is a connection between terrorism and the Western Hemisphere, primarily in Argentina uh, on that example. But when I learned about all this, I said, you know what, we really need, with 80 cultural centers being opened in Latin America by Iran, with what I know about AMIA, what I know about Alberto Nisman, we really need our State Department to direct a, um, a study to find out the Iranian involvement in the Western Hemisphere. And I actually passed a law out of Congress to direct them to do that. And they did a very limp-wristed, weak report on the Iranian activity in the Western Hemisphere because it didn't fit the administrative narr administration's narrative on Iran, because they were working toward that P5 plus one nuclear agreement that uh, President Obama and John Kerry uh, stand on so proudly. So um, we did that, we had that report, it was weak, General Kelly even says it's weak, and um, <coughs> so I've, 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 I've talked about those things. I want to mention um, March 9th, just this past March 9th, in this same area, in the tri-border region, in Uruguay, very close. Uruguay doesn't touch the tri-border, but it touches Argentina. But northern Uruguay, there was a Jewish businessman that was shot. The report said five times, ten times, or fifteen times. It really doesn't matter. He was shot multiple times by, I believe, an Islamic jihadist terrorist who was hollering Allahu Akbar when he shot him and killed him. And they arrested that guy. That's more activity March 9th in this same area of Latin America. So I've really focused on that. Um, so let's expand it to modern day. Let's expand it to what's going on right now in Syria and with ISIS. So we've got this conflict going on between Western Iraq and, and Syria where ISIS uh, is creating a new caliphate. And hopefully you understand the whole caliphate meant uh, a mentality of these jihadists who want to create one world order and a worldwide caliphate, but right now they're just trying to reestablish a caliphate in that region, sort of similar to the Ottoman Empire, so they will have an Islamic state. So there, this war's going on, and they capitalize on the civil war in Syria, and it's caused a lot of Syrians to want to flee the country. A lot of Syrians want to flee the country, come to the United States on this refugee program. You've heard a lot about that. I'll talk more about it in just a second. But not all of them are coming through the normal channels for refugee resettlement. Some are trying to come in, into this country on their own. Six of our partner countries in Latin America have apprehended Syrians traveling through their countries on falsified documents. Now, they're not fake documents in that they didn't alter the passports that they traveled on. They're just a passport that has a picture on it that looks very similar to them. So we've had them in St. Martin, we've had them in uh, Paraguay, we've had them in Costa Rica, we've had them in Dominican Republic, and uh, we've had them in Honduras. Just recently in November, five Syrians were apprehended in Honduras, these are the ones I can talk about off the top of my head, had traveled to Honduras from the tri-border region in Latin America, had traveled to the tri-border region in Latin America, that area between Argentina, Brazil, and uh, Paraguay, had traveled there on fake Israeli passports. Now think about that for a minute, that Syrian traveled on fake Israeli passports that had been stolen in Israel, I traveled to that area, exchanged those passports with Hezbollah in that area because there's a huge false document trade going on in that tri-border region. They traded those passports for fake Greek passports to the cost of about $25,000 for the five people. So they were willing to pay $25,000 extra to travel, uh, to, to get falsified documents, to get new Greek passports that kind of looked like them, transit up through Latin America and apprehended in Honduras at the airport trying to fly to the United States because they couldn't speak Greek and they were traveling on Greek passports. So all these instances of these six partner countries have apprehended Syrians who have been traveling on fake passports. 
Now go back to the tri-border region, there's a huge uh, market there for falsified documents. For Lebanese that have come, from other people in the Middle East that have come to that area, usually through Brazil. They get to an area, going back to the tri-border, uh, there's a town right on the border called Ciudad del Este, City of the East. And in Ciudad del Este, there are huge um, financial transactions going on every day, usually the sale of knockoff, counterfeit, um, or, or contraband-type goods, luggage, CDs, DVDs, you name it, being sold in Ciudad del Este to Brazilians that come over there to buy these goods uh, rather cheaply. Well, all of that financial transaction, even the rent for all the booze, the rent in the apartments, everything in Ciudad del Este, according to their counterterrorism expert uh, that I just met with last week, two weeks ago now, um, all that is being skimmed to fund Hezbollah activities in the Middle East. It's a financial transaction. And our guys with the FBI are trying to work with the Paraguayans that have been for a decade or more to try to track the financial transactions to tie Hezbollah and the financial transactions to the last day and try to stop that. But so you've got all these people coming over here, changing their documents, getting fa false documents to try to come north into the United States on fake passports. In fact, we called some of the uni at the uh, U.S.-Mexican border a family that had fake passports. I don't believe there were anything nefarious going on. Don't believe with the, the five people that were caught in Honduras. We don't believe there were anything, uh, any nefarious activities in their mind. They were farmers and, and teachers. But you never know. If people are willing to spend that kind of money and travel that far, and they're just regular farmers or whatnot, can you imagine what folks that want to do nefarious things in the United States who have that in mind to commit harm to the United States and American citizens, the link that they would go to, especially backed by Iran that has $150 billion extra dollars laying around just to throw toward terrorism. Our border is unsecure. We all know that. The Department of Homeland Security uses a term called OTM, other than Mexicans, people they apprehend that have crossed the southern border that are not of Mexican descent. I first heard about that term not from DHS, but from a guy that runs a security apparatus for the King Ranch in southern Texas, 837,000-acre ranch, about the size of Rhode Island, one of the largest in the country. They've got their own security force, as you can imagine. He said, uh, Congressman, we catch people on our ranch all the time that are OTMs. I said, OTMs explain that term to me. He said, oh, it's a DHS term. It means other than Mexicans. I said, well, you're catching people other than Mexicans. Who are they? He said, they're African, they're Middle Eastern, and they're Asian. Think about that. African, Middle Eastern, Asian that are traveling to Mexico to cross our southern border, which is porous, to come into this country. And they weren't apprehended by DHS. They were apprehended by the King Ranch security. So I started expanding on that and asking the, the apparatus with Customs Border Patrol, Border Protection, uh, and Immigration Customs Enforcement about, and even Secretary Jay Johnson, about the term OTM, other than Mexican. I said, uh, you know, how many of these people are you catching that are not of Mexican descent, that are just coming here to take jobs in horticulture, agriculture, or hospitality? He said, we don't know. We estimate. I said, estimate? What do you mean? He said, well, we don't apprehend them all. We're not, we don't have a, he, he actually acknowledged we don't have a secure border, so we're not apprehending all the people that are coming across the border. We can only guesstimate how many people are coming across. I said, you can only guesstimate how many people are coming across that are not of Mexican descent, that aren't coming to take a job, that are Middle Eastern, African, or Oriental. What are they coming for? That's a question for y'all. What are they coming for? Some might be coming to take jobs, seek better opportunity. Some may be escaping persecution. We need to keep our antenna up. They may be coming to cause great harm to this country, be part of a sleeper cell, or do something else. The bottom line is we don't know because we're not catching them. We've got a poor southern border. We just had recently, um, I guess it was in 2011, <clears throat> so that isn't too recent, but we had an Iranian operative, a Quds Force, uh, Force operative, Quds Force is the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Special Forces, their elite, a Quds Force operative was apprehended in Mexico on their side of the border by an undercover DEA agent who he contacted about helping him get across the southern border and get in this country to get to Washington, D.C., and bring some items along with him because his hope was to assassinate the ambassador from Saudi Arabia in a restaurant in Washington, D.C. that your congressman may have been sitting in. That's scary. He thought he was talking to a drug cartel leader. He was talking to an undercover DEA agent. And we actually stopped that 
terrorist attack in Washington that would have killed the Saudi ambassador. Now, why would an Iranian kill, who is Muslim, kill a, a Saudi uh, ambassador who is also Muslim? Well, you could go Shia Sunni. I'd rather go Persian Arab. There's been a long-running conflict between Persians, which Iranians are Persian, and the Arabs. That's historical. We have to get it right 100% of the time to protect this country. The terrorists only have to get it right once. We've got a poor southern border. Anyone can walk across. We've got apprehensions that are way down. We've got uh, uh, an administration that says we're going to have operational control of the border, and they can't determine or define to us what operational control of the border is. That's why you see Donald Trump succeeding in the presidential campaign because he's talking about securing our southern border. He's talking about it in terms that you and I uh, understand. Let's build a wall. Let's secure our border. American believes in, Americans believe in American sovereignty and that we're a secure nation. We should secure our border. I think we need to talk about that as well that we need a secure border, whether that's fencing, whether that's a wall, or whether that's a, a blend of electronics, censoring manpower, National Guard, Army, it doesn't matter. We need to secure a border because we have OTMs coming. We've got assassination attempts happening. We have no idea who's in our country. We have no idea who's in our country. We've got to get it right 100% of the time. They only have to get it right once. I'll say that again. So ISIS. ISIS has said that they will infiltrate and exploit the Syrian refugee program. We know that to be the fact. That's their own words. I believe with Islamic terrorists, especially uh, the jihadist types like ISIS, I believe you take them at their word. Take them at their word. If they say they're going to exploit the, the mass migration headed into Europe, take them at their word. They're going to exploit that. If they say they're going to exploit the Syrian refugee crisis and Syrian refugee program to come into this country, take them at their word and do everything you can to try to stop that. That's why it's important that we don't allow Syrian refugees to be relocated in South Carolina. That's why I applaud the South Carolina Senate for actually taking this issue up. Uh, I wish the governor would be a little stronger on this issue. I've been very strong. Went down and testified before the South Carolina Senate on this issue. We have got to put a pause in place and not allow any Syrian refugees to come into this country because ISIS has said they will infiltrate that. It only takes one, folks. It only takes one or two in the case of San Bernardino. So I believe in a shelter-in-place type mentality. Let's put the Syrians in camps in Syria. Let's protect them with air cover, no-fly zones, U.S. military, alliance military, whatever it takes, and protect them over there so that when this civil war ends, they can go home. They can go st start rebuilding their own country, start rebuilding their own neighborhoods, living at home, and continuing to be Syrian versus relocating in this country. I understand there's been some great... Uh, meetings about the Syrian refugee program where folks talk about what has happened in these areas where refugees have been resettled. They basically take over, whether they're Somali or Syrian or whatnot. Let's keep them, uh, let's keep the same. I'm sympathetic. I, I don't want to try to help, but let's try to help them in their own country because we can't vet Syrian refugees. All the documents have been stolen, they've been destroyed in the Civil War, or never existed in the first place. Syria was never a, a great country to give us a lot of information about who their people were whether they're refugees or, or visas or whatnot. So Syria never was a good player. We've got to stop that. One thing I've looked at a long time is foreign fighter flow. And we talk about foreign fighter flow, we think about foreign fighters that have left Europe and gone into uh, Syria and Iraq and been radicalized on the battlefield, come back into Europe and commit acts of terror there. We just saw it in Paris. Um, we may see those folks come and get in the Schengen area, uh, no border area, stay in there as Europeans and be able to get a visa waiver and come to the United States commit an act of terror here. I'm right out of time. I want to hit on a couple more things. That's Gitmo, Guantanamo Bay. No state should be a terrorist dumping ground. We do not need Gitmo terrorists in a brig in Charleston, South Carolina. We need to speak very loudly as South Carolinians about that. No terrorist on U.S. soil, primarily South Carolina. When we talk about Gitmo, the president doesn't need to give Guantanamo Bay back to Castro because Castro is going to give that area to, to uh, Russia or China or somebody else. So warm water, close port, uh, great strategic military base. We don't need to allow them to do that. Um, EMPs real quick, because I told uh, Diane that I would talk about that real quick. So about a minute 42. EMPs. Well, I've talked a lot about the, the Western Hemisphere and looking south. If we want to continue looking south with regard to EMPs, we're not secure uh, looking south. We've got our missile defense, NORAD and all that, really looking over the Arctic, looking uh, over toward uh, North Korea, 
Um, we're really focused on what the Russians and North Koreans and the Chinese may do. But with nuclear submarines um, and container ships and the miniaturization of, of all things nuclear, uh, they could very well come south, come to Cuba, come to the Gulf of Mexico and shoot something over our southern border, or over our southern uh, area, and um, we wouldn't have the missile capability or the defense capability to stop that in uh, what I understand. Electromagnetic pulses can happen from uh, either a nuclear weapon shot at high up in the atmosphere, um, which would fry our electric grid, or it can happen natural, naturally with uh, the sun. We've seen that happen in New York uh, in recent memory. We've got to protect our grid. I'm part of the EMP caucus. Trent Franks from Arizona is chairman of that. Uh, we need to be more active with the EMP caucus. We've got an appropriations process coming up. I hope we can work on trying to redirect some of the money in the Department of Defense or uh, energy and water approach or something, try to harden our grid. We're really only talking about $3 billion. Now, $3 billion is a lot of money when you think about South Carolina's budget's only about, about $5 billion. But $3 billion would harden the grid for all the nation. Three billion dollars, the nation probably blew three million dollars while I've been talking. It's not that much money when you're talking about the kind of spending that you see out of Washington. But we need to make the investment, we need to make the commitment as a, as a, a nation to harden our grid. If you hadn't read a book, there's called a, a book called One Second After. Uh, it's about EMPs. I highly recommend it. The guy that wrote it lives in Black Mountain, North Carolina. It's actually set in Black Mountain, North Carolina. I think he's a professor at Mont Treat, isn't he, Ambassador? Um, one second after. It's a short read. It's, it's everything that happens that second after an EMP happens. Because guess what? You're not going to be able to crank your car unless you've got an, uh, a vehicle that's uh, um, older than like 1984. Anything with solid state circuitry is not going to work. That clock's not going to work. That camera's not going to work. This cell phone in my pocket is not going to work. In fact, all communications are going to be shot. Your electric grid's going down. You're not going to be able to heat and cool your house. You're not going to be able to keep penicillin cold. So you're going to run out of your supply of pharmaceuticals. You're not going to be able to process clean drinking water, much less pump water from your well if you have electricity. If you have a generator, it's probably fried too. Uh, an EMP is probably worse than a nuclear weapon because we all live and then we die slowly from disease from attacking each other for food, from uh, um, people that resort to cannibalism over time when they can't eat. Uh, all these things that happen are played out in that book one second after. If you really want to be aware of what all the repercussions are from an EMP event, you can read that. So we need to do what we can as a nation, and this is a topic we ought to talk about a lot more, is electromagnetic pulse created by a low altitude um, nuclear weapon exploded, which actually sends an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse, uh, down, which fries our total electric grid. And we don't talk about that near enough. We don't talk about it in Congress enough. We don't talk about it in our, in our circles enough. We don't talk about it in our state capitals enough. We don't talk with our congressmen and senators enough about this issue. And that's how important it is. And when you read this book and you hear guys like Ambassador Cooper talk about it, you will fully understand that we need to get engaged on this issue. So uh, I think my time's up. I want to say thank you for giving me a chance to speak with you today. We covered a lot. Uh, I, I'm focused on keeping America safe, securing our southern border, and addressing the threats that may come across our southern border, especially in this hemisphere, because that's where my work has taken me at this point in time. But uh, we're not going to take our eye off the ball of China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, the Middle East in general, and all the terrorist threats. So God bless you. Thank you so much.